Hey friends, advertisers are on an endless quest to convince you that you need things that you just don't need. This is especially true of plugin companies and their flashy trailers, gorgeous colorful user interfaces, made up word parameters, all trying to convince you that you couldn't possibly do what their shiny new plugin does with the tools that you already own in your DAW. But is that actually true? In this video, I'm going to save you some money by looking at how you can use devices in Ableton Live to do precisely the same things that expensive plugins do. This may end up being a series of videos because there are so many examples of this phenomenon that I had to edit out half of my footage just to get this video to be the right length. So in that spirit, if you have a suggestion for what Ableton does that's as good or better than what expensive plugins do, please leave it down in the comments. Definitely watch this whole video because I'm sure it will blow your mind and I'm sure that you will learn something valuable from it. Let's go. Okay, so perhaps the lowest hanging fruit here is Ableton and Cytomic's amazing glue compressor, which is modeled after a solid state logic bus compressor from the 80s. Now, it's no secret that I love UAD plugins, but in this specific case, UAD sells their SSL G bus compressor for a whopping 300 bones. Here, I'm gonna compare UAD's version of this compressor with Ableton's, which comes free with Ableton Suite and Standard. Let's check it out. Okay, so for this example, I'm using glue compressor, of course, and then the SSL G-Bus compressor. I've put them in as close of the same settings as possible, and in this situation, we're using them both 60% wet as a parallel compressor on a drum bus. So let's go ahead and listen to the dry signal. Okay, so that's the dry signal. Let's go ahead and listen to the UAD. Okay, so we can see that even though the threshold setting isn't exactly the same, it doesn't matter because essentially the threshold is different on the SSL than it is on the glue compressor. Essentially the headroom setting is different on this compressor, but we're getting to negative 12 on both of these. So we're biting into the signal the same amount, okay? The makeup gain is set exactly the same at 10 dB. We have the fastest attack set on both of these and a similar release time. We have a four to one ratio on both of these compressors and we have a 60% mix. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go bounce back and forth between these two compressors and you tell me if this is worth $300 in difference. And so these are two different plugins with two different programmers. So these plugins are not achieving exactly the same effect, but it's very, very similar. The only thing that I hear is that in the snare drum, it sounds a bit more squashed in the G-Bus compressor than it does on the glue compressor, but maybe that's something you don't even want. And that's something that we could easily dial in with the glue compressor. In terms of sound quality, they are functionally identical. They sound incredible. They both sound really, really good. But in this case, let's look at the difference. If I hover over the title bar of the UAD, we are using 5.1 milliseconds of processing latency where the glue compressor amazingly is only at 0.67 and we can actually defeat that by turning the oversampling off. Let's go ahead and listen to the difference now. For a nearly identical result, for this glue compressor to be able to do this at zero samples, I feel like I've said this before, but this is one of the greatest achievements, in my opinion, of modern audio processing. Cytomic absolutely killed it. So yeah, is the UAD SSL G-Bus compressor worth $300? Absolutely not for people that own Ableton Live. So hard clipping has become a really hot topic in modern music production. Transparently clipping signals before they go into a limiter is a great way to get a nice loud mix. This allows the limiter to not have to contend with crazy peak signals and to work more transparently. Ableton has a really capable clipper built right into the software using two different clipping modes in their saturator device. I'm going to compare these two clipping modes to Kazrog's really great K-Clip plugin, which costs 50 bucks. Let's check it out. Okay, so for this example, we're looking at Ableton's session view right here. And the reason I want to do that is I want to be able to look at the metering so we can see the RMS and peak signal. So let's go ahead and listen to this loop. 
So you can see that we're hovering around maybe negative uh, 15 RMS, but the peak signal is going almost all the way up to zero. So we could really benefit from hard clipping in this example. Now in Ableton Saturator, I told you there were two different clipping modes. There's the analog clip mode and there's the digital clip mode. I think it's best to start with digital clip because it's the most transparent mode. So check this out. I'm gonna start adding signal. Let's go ahead and add 7 dB to the input and we'll take 7 dB out of the output. Essentially what we're doing is we're pushing that signal up into the clipping stage and we're removing the same amount of volume from the output. So essentially what we're doing is we are clipping the signal and hopefully this will be completely transparent. So without the saturator, we see negative 2.5 uh, decibels on the peak meter. If we turn on the saturator though, we've saved ourselves an amazing almost 6 dB here. But let's keep going. Let's maybe go up to 10. So when I'm using digital clip, for every decibel amount that I put in, I need to take out of the output in order to get the benefit, right? So without it, negative 2.5, with it, an amazing negative 7.75. And we could probably save more by right-clicking on the title bar and turning off high quality. What this will do is this will turn off any oversampling having to do with the saturator. And let's see what we have now. Now we have a situation where we have a true negative 10 benefit. So let's listen to the original. Now there is a little bit of clipping in there. I just the smallest amount, I can barely hear it. And the question you need to ask yourself is that in a mix, would you ever hear that? Probably not. Of course you hear a little bit of it when it's soloed, but yeah, you gotta ask yourself that question. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at Kazrog's K-Clip. I really like this plugin for a lot of reasons, but essentially this plugin has different clipping algorithms as well, and Smooth is their main clipping algorithm, and what I've done is I've turned off the oversampling so we can get a really similar uh, measurement here. So, of course, let's try with the, with the 7 in, 7 out. I don't hear any clipping at all. Let's go ahead and turn it up to 10. There's a little bit of clipping right there at the end when all those drums kind of built up right there. And that's almost the same thing as Saturator. Let's go ahead and listen to Saturator doing the same thing. In fact, let's go ahead and do this. I'll key map these two and bounce back and forth between them using my Z key. So we'll start with Ableton Saturator and we'll go over to K-Clip. It seems like to me, I'm hearing the clipping in exactly the same spot in that loop. Let's go ahead and isolate that one spot. Okay, so thus far, both of these clippers are kind of making the same amount of clipping, right? So let's go ahead and crank this up a bit. Let's go up to maybe 13 in and minus 13 out on the saturator, and we'll do the same thing with K-Clip. 13 in and 13 out. You can link the input and output together. So I just turned up the in and it turned the out down 13 on K-Clip. Okay, so now let's listen to this example and I'm gonna flip back and forth between these two clippers and we're gonna listen to the actual clipping. So essentially what's happening here is that K-Clip is just using a hard clipping curve. A hard clipping curve cannot be improved upon. It's always going to be the same. However, K-Clip does have a different mode called Crisp, and sometimes, just sometimes, this can really make a difference. Let's take a listen now. Now, of course, there's still clipping in there, and you can still obviously hear it, but sometimes I've noticed that if you switch it over to Crisp mode on the K-Clip, you can get a more pleasing result that actually will blend into a mix a little bit better, especially if you're making heavy and hard EDM and things like that, okay? But functionally, using their original algorithm, I'm sorry, I hate to say it, but the but the smooth algorithm, essentially all that it is is just a hard clipping curve. Is that worth $50 to you? You need to discern that yourself. And maybe it's something like, well, I really like this ability to link the inputs and outputs. Well, that's easily solvable inside of Ableton. All we'd have to do is make ourselves an audio rack where it is turning up the input and output simultaneously. 
And that's what I've done here with this little rack here. This is just using a similar volume knob to turn the input and output up identical amounts. So no matter where I set this, you can see that it's turning things up and turning things down the same amount. So if that's really all that you're after, you can build it in Ableton easily. Okay. So another hot topic in music production is sidechain ducking. There are many different solutions out there, but I imagine that a lot of people are getting the notion that they need to have a sidechain ducker. This isn't true at all. You can use the sidechain input on Ableton's compressor and get really, really good results, sometimes even better results than you could get with a ducker, and they're really highly configurable. Let's take a look. So in this example, we're going to use the drum loop from before, but we're going to add this basic FM operator patch. There's no frills, it's just a really basic FM bass. Let's take a listen. Just a hastily put together bass line. So let's go ahead and grab an Ableton compressor. Okay, so I'm just going to feed the sidechain input here from clippers, which is the name of the track that that's living on. And we're going to choose the kick drum. So we can see the kick drum come in. So I'm going to go ahead and debunk a bunch of things with this example. I'm going to turn the ratio all the way up. I'm going to turn the attack all the way down. Now I'm going to start digging into that kick drum signal, which is going to duck the bass whenever it hits. I'm also going to put it on peak mode so we can get the peak signal really starting to dig into that bass track. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to record the output so we can actually do some debunking here. So I'm here's the output and I'm going to record that from operator. The first thing that folks make the assumption of is that a sidechain ducker is going to be quote unquote faster or more accurate than a compressor. Let's go ahead and test that. So the settings that we have right now have no look ahead time, okay? And we have a, an attack of 0 0.01 milliseconds. Let's go ahead and record this. Okay, so let's zoom in and look at this. So we can see, if we get, we're, we're way zoomed in here. We can see that right on that downbeat, we might be missing just the smallest fraction of space to get that bass out of the way when the kick drum hits, right? Most folks think that there's nothing that you can do about this. There's so much that you can do about this. What we're seeing here is we're seeing that 0 0.01 milliseconds of attack, and we're seeing the fact that we have zero look ahead time. If I put this on, for example, one millisecond, let's record the same thing again. So now I'm going to zoom in again. Let's go to that same spot. And now we can see that we've added that time, that one millisecond ahead of the kick drum hit, right? Most folks think that this is an error. This is not an error. This is a feature. Okay, this is a feature of a sidechain compressor. What I can do now is I can, if I have clicks and pops, I can now open the attack time a little bit and still get that bass out of the way when the kick drum hits. Okay, so let's go ahead and record it now that I've got a little more attack time. So now when I zoom in, we can see that we have opened, look how much longer that attack phase is, okay? So you can get away with a lot more with this, all right? You can even push the look ahead time to all the way 10 milliseconds, okay? Now, 10 milliseconds starts to get into where a human could hear that the bass is disappearing sooner than the kick drum. And so this is situations where you'd wanna have a much larger or longer attack time, okay? But all the options that are available to you here are amazing. Now, of course, you can't draw an exact envelope with a compressor. A compressor can only react to the signal that's coming into it. But you do have a lot of control here. You have control over attack. You have control over how, how long the release time is. You have control over whether the envelope itself is linear or logarithmic. Okay. And you also even have control over the knee. And I'll say one more thing. An experienced person using a compressor and a sidechain input is going to get much better results than somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, just slapping a ducker onto a track. All right, let's move on to the next example. So this is one of the most surprising and disappointing discoveries that I've made in a long time. Here I'm going to compare Neural DSP Corey Wong's Guitar Modeler plugin versus Ableton's built-in amp and cabinet devices. Now you might think that there's absolutely no contest and that these two devices could never compare to each other, but after watching this section, you might be a little surprised. Let's check it out. Okay, now the first thing I want to say is that I readily admit that there's no way that you could do an A-B comparison with really any plugin, but especially when it comes to guitar amp modeling, like this is gonna be the ability of the programmer and the ability of the program itself to give the, the user the access to the controls that they would need to make a good tone, okay? So I know we're comparing apples to oranges, but let's go ahead and dive into this a little bit. 
You remember what I said about flashy user interfaces. Here we are looking at Corey Wong's the amp snob amp situation. And just off the bat, let's just look at something. If I hit the P key, I'm going to be switching over to uh, Soft Tubes and Ableton's Rock Amp. This is uh, with uh, Amp, you get all these different amp models that you can choose from, as well as Cabinet. And to do a one for one comparison here, if you look over at this page, you can see that we have two different mics set up. So I have a condenser mic on the cone and then an offset dynamic mic. And so I did the same thing with the rock cabinet. We have a condenser mic near on axis, right? And then we have an off axis dynamic mic. So I was just trying to make the same kind of uh, setup. I, again, apples to oranges, okay. So let's go ahead and just listen to the tone difference. So. That is the archetype plugin, and then here we go with the uh, Ableton amp. Back to archetype. Now, as you can see, I tried to make both of these make about the same RMS level so that you weren't listening to the loudness of one amp and thinking, okay, that amp is obviously better. But this has got to be a little bit staggering to you. By a little bit of racking up, okay, I've racked this up a little bit. I've got two different cabinets, okay, which is a really important thing to do when you're trying to simulate a recorded guitar. Likely in the studio, any studio you're going to run into, likely they mic'd the guitar cabinet with more than one mic because it allows you to get a much better tone. You get all the qualities of a nice condenser microphone and you get all the qualities of an off-axis dynamic microphone in this specific setup, okay? So that's the first thing. But, but what's really surprising to me is that I like both of these tones for different reasons. But something that's really blowing my mind is that if I switch over to the Corey Wong thing, look at my CPU. Are you kidding me? I don't even like this tone that much more to warrant even half that CPU. I don't understand how plugin developers can get away with this much processing. It's insane. Look at Ableton's amp. The only reason you're seeing 4% is from other processing that's happening in the set. That doesn't even have to do with this situation. So if I was going to sit down and try to record using this archetype plugin, okay, uh, if I was going to sit down and try to record this on a set, I better hope that set isn't using too many resources or else I'm not even going to be able to record. I think this is unacceptable, first of all, especially for a tone that's not just marginally better, maybe. I mean, maybe some people's ears would prefer this rock tone that I'm making with this kind of, at this point, dated technology, right? Now, if you're interested in how this was made, I have a whole video dedicated to making um, really great modeler tones with just Ableton devices, and you can check that out up in the corner. But let's talk about one more thing. So I'm going to switch back to archetype. Now, if you listen to... I'm going to go ahead and turn this chorus ensemble on. This is just the chorus on its vanilla setting. Now, when you hear this, you might be like, wait, something's wrong. And yeah, you're right. There's no stereo aspect to this. The archetype uh, model is actually collapsing everything to mono unless I turn on the stereo mode. Okay, I'll turn on stereo. What? <laughs> We're almost at 36% CPU. And it's kind of bouncing around sporadically. Are you kidding me? What is wrong with these developers? Now, if I switch over to amp, though, take a listen. That's right, folks. It's stereo. Just by turning on this mode and then by turning on both of my cabinets to dual mode. First of all, doing this gives me no CPU hit whatsoever. Okay, and it's... Sounds great. Now I switch back to the archetype. And I can get that that stereo chorus, but is it worth the CPU? Absolutely not. So if you're gonna be doing some stereo processing going into this amp modeler, I hate to break it to you, man, but this just isn't the way. I'm sorry, it's just not worth it. It's it's insane how much CPU this is using for the result that you're getting. I don't, I don't think it's worth it. And to, to, to add insult to injury, this thing is 119. I just got the demo. Fortunately, I'm glad I just got the demo, but it's uh, 119. Now, 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 anyone that's going to record guitar recording in a studio environment aren't going to be using a plugin anyway. I couldn't dream of recording my guitar uh, just using plugins. I would obviously always be miking up an amp because at this point, um, even with my little fractal pedal, I really, really enjoy using microphones. I get much better results a lot faster, and it's just kind of alive and, and, and real. Um, I think that these archetype plugins are sold with the idea that folks are going to be recording with them, and I just hate to break it to you all, but this is just not the way. Now, folks will be using these things live, right? 
And I think a lot of people get the Archetype plugins or other guitar modelers to perform with live. But I hate to say it, man, like 36% CPU. All right, so let's say you're just going to do mono. Cool. But still, 20 uh, this kind of CPU hit live is crazy. So yeah, long story short, I don't I don't mean to sit here and shit on this, but man, it it really irks me that they didn't spend the time to optimize this plugin to make it usable for folks. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to reverbs. Now this one for me is a no-brainer, but for comparison's sake, let's look at Ableton's hybrid reverb versus Eventide's Black Hole, a plugin that costs a staggering $200. Let's take a look. Okay, so for the source material, I just have a classic wavetable playing just a quick synth stab. Okay, so this sound is obviously ripe for some reverb. Let's go ahead and listen to Ableton's hybrid reverb, and this is using somewhat of what I would consider to be like a black hole style uh, preset, where we have a lot of modulation going on, right? We have an incredibly large room and an incredibly long decay, right? So we get this sound. Now, that's gonna last a really long time, right? It's a crazy sound, right? Let's go over to Black Hole. So the Black Hole plugin is iconic, right? It makes a very iconic sound. It makes a very, very big sound. Like this reverb is known for, for its ability to take like a Casio keyboard and turn it into, it makes you instantly Hans Zimmer or something, right? It, it sounds really big and huge, right? Let's take a listen. Now in this situation, I've turned the size all the way up, right? And I have gravity, which is kind of how they deal with decay time. I have the gravity turned up pretty high, right? Let's go ahead and listen to the hybrid reverb. Now, to me, the black hole reverb sounds a bit more controlled. It sounds like it, it's not as wide. It's a little bit more focused. Um, and, and the EQ curve that is on it, I actually really appreciate it. The cool thing about hybrid reverb, though, is that you're, you're blessed with so many more options. First of all, you have a parametric equalizer at the end of the reverb. And of course, you could always drop an EQ after black hole. But the onboard EQ is really kind of lacking. You have a resonance, which basically means you can make a resonant hump on any one of these filters that you have right here, and that's about it. Now, thus far, it would you, you would feel like maybe Black Hole has the upper hand in terms of sound quality. And I will admit that it's really nice to be able to have a depth control and a rate control for your modulation inside of the reverb. The, the chorusing, for example, of the reverb is maybe a bit more nuanced and dialed in here with the Black Hole, but Something that really drives me nuts about Black Hole is that when I turn it on and I start something, and then I freeze the reverb, the reverb is now functionally frozen, right? I can no longer feed the signal into the frozen sound, right? It's only dry. But, in Ableton's hybrid reverb, using the quartz algorithm, now mind you, I'm not even using the convolution side, I'm just using the quartz algorithm, I can freeze the effect and I can keep adding signal to it. Check this out. So now the reverb's frozen, and if I turn this switch on, check this out. Now, to me, what's cool about this is that I can further sculpt a frozen signal, okay, or a reverb that has an infinite tail. I can further add more and more sounds to it, creating a soundscape that I can then filter and chop up into new usable material. I wish that I could do that with Black Hole. Now, Hybrid Reverb comes with Ableton, or at least Ableton Suite, and I mean, to me, the value is through the roof. You not only get five different amazing algorithms of reverb, but you also get a convolution side where you can drag in IRs and do all kinds of other stuff. So I see what Eventide is up against here. They don't want to give their black hole algorithm away for cheap, but at the same time, the value to cost situation, I got to say the Hybrid Reverb for me has the upper hand. So finally, you might think that you need a limiter outside of Ableton's crappy limiter solution. And yeah, there are definitely better ones out there, but now you can have arguably the best one in I know limiters, thanks to Trump's brick wall limiter. The description of this device is hilarious. Like another wall being built, this device is ill thought out, poorly programmed and impulsive by nature. <laughs> Check it out.
I'm obviously kidding. That limiter is trash. And so is Donald Trump. But that brings me to my final point, and that's that there are definitely a couple things that Ableton could do better, especially limiting. But how can you know which situations are better suited for plugins, or if Ableton can handle it fine on its own? Well, that's where education comes in, and if you like how I teach, I encourage you to check out my Ableton courses, which you can find a link to in the description and in the comments. I have a free little workshop you can watch where I create a full tune using what I consider to be the most important Ableton skills, and you can check that out over here. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope that you learned something. As always, a sub and a bell helps the channel out. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.